Have you ever felt abandoned by God? You don't have to raise your hand. You can if you want. But have you, ever, have you ever had a season in your life where it's like, God, where are you? Like, and I know sometimes we just feel apart from God, but sometimes we, we might feel like he's actually abandoned us, like given up on us. I, I know that there's been seasons where it kind of felt like that a little bit to me. And I know a lot of people have felt that. Maybe you're feeling that right now. Maybe this morning you're like, has God abandoned me? It doesn't mean like you don't believe in him. It's just like I don't sense his presence. I don't feel like he's working in my life. Well, that's what we're going to look at today. We're in a sermon series. Uh, this is uh, number four called How to Move from Languishing to Flourishing. And the idea of languishing is that we, we become sort of dispirited. And that happens to a lot of people where it just... Life's circumstances kind of just um, suck the vitality out of us. I've, I've, I've said um, maybe a better word is like we're in a funk, right? You ever get in a funk? I, I've had some shorter term funks, but I've had a few that, that lasted a while. And you don't really realize like you're going into it. You don't really realize you're there until you're there for a while. And then you kind of just wake up someday like... <sighs> Why do I, I feel numb? Or I, I feel, I don't feel alive, or I feel like life is sucking the life out of me. You ever feel like that? I, a lot of people have felt like that. And, um, and that's why we're, we're uh, doing this sermon series, because God doesn't want you to live like that. The, in fact, the Bible says, Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, that he wants you to flourish. He wants you to live the abundant life. Which does not mean that every day will be easy. Jesus doesn't promise that. But he does promise that you could have an abundant life. A life of flourishing. Where there is purpose and, and, and vigor. And you don't have to live dispirited. He wants that for you. And the sermon series is based on uh, a guy, the, the, li- the lessons we've learned from a guy named Gideon. Who lived about mm, 1400 BC, roughly. And his story is found in the book of Judges, starting in uh, chapter 6. So Judges 6, 7, and 8 is about the life of Gideon and uh, how God used him to actually take an entire nation from languishing to flourishing, the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. So just a quick recap, as we pick up the story of, of Gideon, Uh, They had been overran by the Midianites for the past seven years. And every year, right at harvest time, when their crops, when their flourishing crops and bountiful crops were ready to be harvested, the Midianites would sweep in with all their thousands of camels and donkeys and, and steal their harvest. And I don't know if they just didn't have the ability or the, or the, stomach, but the nation of Israel didn't really fight back. They just, in fact, the Bible says they would, they just started hiding in rocks and caves and let the bully come in and steal all their stuff and then go back to to Midian. This was going on for seven years and the nation was languishing. And it finally, it says they finally cried out to God, God, help, finally, after seven years. And so the, the, the past three sermons are kind of what led up to that and, and through that. And if you, can, you can go to our website, newlifefairfield.com, and look at those uh, past three sermons. They're there. Um, but today we're going uh, we're gonna to pick it, the story up in Judges chapter 6, verse 13. It says, an angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. Uh, and I explained this last week, so I'm not going to take a lot of time. Sometimes in the Bible, an angel of the Lord is an angel like Gabriel or Michael or whatever. It's a created being um, created by God that's not God that gives a message, right? Or does some sort of supernatural work. Oftentimes in the Bible, the angel of the Lord is God himself. And you can tell by the the conversation whether it's God or an angel. And in this context, we know from reading that it's actually God, Without trying to going into a lot of explaining, 
Jesus was born as a human on what we celebrate as Christmas, but when the angels came and announced to the shepherds and he was born of the Virgin Mary, Jesus was, came to this earth as a, fully as a human. He was God, but he had set his God to decide, but he, he was born as a human um, about 2,000 years ago. But Jesus has always existed. He didn't come into existence 2,000 years ago. He has always existed, the Bible says. And, and he was actually the, the creation came through Jesus, the Bible says. And so with these, um, uh, uh, we call them theophanies, but when, when God would appear, the angel of the Lord would come and talk to somebody. Basically, that's a pre-incarnate Christ appearing to people. So before Jesus became human, he did appear to people on the earth as the angel of the Lord, right? It happened to Abraham, Joshua, Moses, Hagar. It happened to several people, and Gideon happened to be one. So that's what's going on here in Judges chapter 6, verse 13. And so last week we talked about how God said, uh, the pre-incarnate Christ, Christ taught, the angel of the Lord talking to Gideon said, uh, called him a mighty warrior, and that I'm going to use you, I'm going to work through you, and we're going to defeat Midian. So we pick up the conversation. Verse 13, pardon me, Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. At this point, Gideon probably wasn't sure this was really God himself. He was kind of thinking maybe it's just an angel. And we'll find out probably next week or the next week that, you know, he finds out this is really God, all right? So he's like, and he, so he calls him Lord, but they called angels that too. It just means master sometimes. So he's saying, pardon me, sir, whoever you are. <laughs> Obviously, God is not with us. Because if God is with us, we wouldn't be suffering right now. The God I've heard of wouldn't let us suffer like this. But here we are suffering. So obviously, he's abandoned us. Maybe some of you felt that way. If you haven't, I know you know people who have felt that way. Like God has maybe abandoned us. I've I've heard it a lot. People feel like, well, I've I've just gone too far. I've done too much wrong. You know, I've I've done too much bad stuff in my life or whatever. There's lots of excuses why people think that God has abandoned us or them. But does he really do that? Does that, does God abandon people? That's, a, that's an, a question you need to know the answer to. Because you, if it's not happened to you, it, it may happen to you in the future that you feel like God has abandoned you. But I know that you will run across, if you haven't done it already, you will run across people, Christians, who feel like God has abandoned them. And they might say that. <laughs> and what are, you, what are you gonna say? How can you help them, right? So does God abandon us? Well, thankfully, The Bible tells us. Here's what it says. It's both in the Old and New Testament. I'm going to read out the New Testament, which is basically quoting out of the Old Testament. It's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 31, but this is in Hebrews 13, the last part of verse 5. It says, For God has said, so this is God saying, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So God says, I will never abandon you. But people like Gideon and and maybe some people you know have said, feel like God has abandoned me. So now we know from reading the Bible, like um, you might feel like that, but he doesn't do that. So so why do we feel abandoned? Good question, right? Hope it's a good question because that's what I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about. Here's the truth, and it might not be easy for you to hear, but we need to talk about it. Actually, it's kind of good news in in a way. God doesn't abandon us. We abandon him. 
And why is that good news? Because <laughs> if God abandoned us, there's not a lot we could do about that. Right? But when we feel abandoned by God, in reality, what has happened is you've abandoned him. Which is the good news is you can always come back. That's the good, that's the good news, right? So it's good news that God will never abandon you. But it's also good news if you feel abandoned, it's not him, it's you, and you can, you can come back. The nation of Israel, leading up to this time of Gideon in, in Judges 6, had abandoned God. It, when you read, and, and, and that wasn't the first time and it wasn't the last time, it, they, they had this roller coaster relationship with God. Times they were really close to God, worshiping Him passionately, and, and God was blessing them, and then they would get complacent with all their blessings, and they would just get sort of distracted with all the material things and their sensual desires, and pretty soon they, they would find themselves not in relationship with God and actually even serving other idols, pagan gods, and then their life would <laughs> hit the skids, and then they'd cry out to God, and he'd come back, and then just up and down and up. 400 years of this in the book of Judges. And that was, that was what was going on, but Israel had abandoned God. But, it, but they were saying, why has he abandoned us? <laughs> it doesn't appear, as I read uh, Israel's history, it doesn't appear that they, they really just woke up one day and said, you know what, we're going to reject God. That God is not good, or he's not real, or, so we're just, we reject him. I don't really read that. I mean, there might be a, been a few individuals that might have done that, but basically, they didn't reject God they, it's more like they neglected God. And I think that's, that's the way it is with, with Christians. I mean, if, if they rejected God, they're no longer a Christian. But Christians who find themselves in a place where they feel like God has abandoned them. And it's like, okay, the truth is they've abandoned God. It's not like they just woke up and said, God, I reject you. I'm done with you. No, it's like little by little, their attention has been diverted and, and little by little, they've begun to neglect God. And as that goes over time, pretty soon, they feel abandoned by God. Like, God, where are you? <laughs> what he, and what he really needs to ask is like, well, uh, where are you? So that's really what happens. And the word neglect really means, basically, it means to not pay attention to. If you neglect something, you're not rejecting it. You're just not paying attention to it. And that happens, oh man, it's happened in my own life. But as a pastor, working with lots of different people in lots of stages of their spiritual life, I can tell you that there are a lot of people who feel that God has abandoned them. And what has really happened is they've just begun to neglect God little by little and it's kind of built up to the point where they don't even feel like God's at, at work in their life. And it's kind of true, but it's not because he doesn't want to work in their life, it's because they've been neglecting them. So here's what I've kind of found out, uh, determined, I guess, over, over the years, is that most people don't kick God out of their life. They crowd him out. That happens a lot. And, and I've seen so many Christians who have crowded God out of their life with so many other things that over time, sometime they wake up and like, God, where are you? And he's like, where are you? I've been right here the whole time. You're the one that wandered off. So I want to talk about that today. The, um, there, of, of how we neglect God, because he doesn't neglect us. It feels like it, but it's us, not him. And there, there are, I'm sure, numerous, numerous ways in which we neglect God. But as I really ponder this and, and consider the Bible, I think there's probably three 
main areas that, I mean, all these numerous ways in which we could neglect God, I think there's three main areas in, in which, how we do it. And so that's what I want to point out today. So I'm going to point out like, okay, here's the problem of our neglect. Like, here's how we neglect God, but then I'm going to give you a solution. It's not enough to give a problem. You better give the solution, right? Because it's in, it's in the Bible. So we're going to look at that, just the three ways we ne neglect God, and then what's the solution to that? Here's the first one, problem number one. We neglect the worship of God. The word worship comes from an old English word, actually two words, worth, W-R-T-H, which means value, right? And ship, which means the condition of or the character of. And so when we talk about worship of God, we're talking about his worth-ship, the character and condition of his worthiness, the character and condition of his value. And so when we worship, we're saying, God, you are worth it. You are valuable. You are worthy of our praise. All right, that's a really basic definition of worship, is to proclaim the, the value and worth of, of something. Um, the Bible was written basically in two languages. I mean, there's a little Aramaic in there, but basically it's, it's Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek in the New Testament. But both the Hebrew and Greek words, Old and New Testament, for worship have this idea of bowing low. Like, uh, it's a posture, a spiritual posture and even a physical posture where we, where we bow low. It's, a, it's, it's a humility uh, and, and to lean toward, bow low and lean toward. And in the, the Greek word for worship, uh, proskuneo, one of the root words means to kiss. So you bow low, lean forward to kiss, and the root word of, of the kiss is, has this idea of a dog licking its master's hand. You ever have a dog lick your hand? Now, like my mom, like she doesn't like that. She comes over to my house, get your nose off my... <laughs> but, but that's not her dog, right? Now, when my, the same dog comes up and licks the back of my hand, what's my dog telling me? I love you, master. <laughs> what movie was that? Up or something? Up, yeah. But that, that's what, when, when dogs, when your dog comes up to you and lovingly sides, sides up to you or whatever and licks the back of your hand, your dog is saying, you're the master, and I love you and I trust you. You're awesome. And so this idea of worship, <laughs> I know it's like we don't lick God's hand. But, but it's that sort of attitude. It's like, God, you're the master. You're my master. And I'm comfortable with you and I love you. I'm just going to lick the back of your hand and let you know that. That's what worship is really all about. <laughs> It's both proclamation and posture. It's, it's both of those. But as ba at its basic definition, worship is proclaiming worth and value. It's easy to start giving other things in our life more worth and value than God. We would never say that. You ask any Christian, uh, professing Christian, uh, you know, what's the most important thing in your life? Most of them would say, God. But is that really true? Are there things that have crowded out God? You didn't kick God out, but he's been crowded out. Are there things in your life that are, are crowding God out? Things that all of a sudden you're putting more worth and value on than him. Now, you wouldn't do that consciously, but you, we, we do it. I did it. I mean, I was saved when I was 10 years old. I uh, Seabar and Bible camp. I've grown up in church. I've always known God. Um, but there were been times in my life where now that I look back, I, could, I have to admit there have been times in my life when other things other than God had more worth and value in my life. Now, I would never have been able to admit it then or even see it. But now looking back, I can totally see it. And I've shared this before, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but one of those was the areas when I was farming. 
owning and operating a family farm became my idol. That's another sermon a few weeks from now. <laughs> but I, if you would ask me during my farming years, what's the most important thing in your life? I was at God. Except that was not, would not have been true. What would have been true is my farm. And then God. It's hard to say that, but it, it's true. And I couldn't have seen it. Well, I didn't see it at that time. There are so many things that can creep into our life. And good things, farming or owning your own business can be a really good thing until it crowds out God and, and, and has more worth in your life and more value in your life than God. Sports and recreation, including hunting, can be a really good thing until it crowds out God in your life. Family can be a really good thing until it crowds out God in your life. And you're like, is that possible? Seen it. Seen it a hundred times. Where family becomes almost an idol and the worth and value of family overshadows worth and value of God. It seems like crazy, but I've seen it happen. And there could be other relationships too, same way. If you, can I just get, if you, if you, you might be thinking, am I, am I doing that? I, I want you to think that because I want you to, I, we're not going to stay here, but I want you to think, are there things in my life that might be crowding God out? And it, I, I'll give you a really easy diagnostic. Look at your calendar, look at your checkbook. What are you spending your money on and what are you spending your time on? If you look at those things, that's going to tell you where you're putting your worth in your time. I'm, I'm talking about discretionary money. I know you need to spend money on food and clothing and housing. And I know you need to spend your time working to, to have money to, to pay for those things. I get that. But I'm talking about your discretionary time, your discretionary money. What are you spending your, your money on? I'm not saying you can never spend money on those things. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying if that's where it's going and it's not going towards building God's kingdom, then you might need to ask the Holy Spirit, am I putting more worth on that than I am on, on God? So what's the solution? I mean, the problem is we neglect the worship of God because we've, we've worth, worth and value, that's, that's the words we're using, we've attributed more worth and value to something else. Things have crowded it out. So what's the, what's the solution? Offer yourself to God before anything else. It's like, God, first and foremost, I'm yours and you're mine and we're going to do your business first and when after your business is taken care of or whatever, then we'll do my stuff. But what do you want? Romans 12, 1. Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. How do you worship God? You offer him your life. That's what this says. It's much easier to offer God a dead animal than your living life. That's redundant. That didn't sound right. But you understand what I'm saying? And I've heard this before. This is not my original saying, so don't, don't think I'm real clever. But the problem with living sacrifices is that they keep crawling off the altar. Right? You, you flop a dead animal down, it's going to stay on the altar, right? Until it burns up or whatever. Like, we'll come to God and we'll lay our life down on the altar. God, I give you my life. Until a shiny object comes along and we got to chase that. Right? <laughs> um, worship is not just an exercise on Sunday morning. Although, that's an important part of our Christian life. It's really important to come into the, the manifest presence of God. God's everywhere present, but when... We enter into heartfelt worship when we make ourselves low before God and lift him up and come into his presence. The book of Hebrews talks a lot about that, that 
we sense his real presence and it's life changing. That's, that's important. And that doesn't happen just on a Sunday morning. That can happen lots of places and lots of times. But it should happen here on Sunday morning. Doesn't always. I mean, that's not the only place is, is what I'm trying to say. But, it, but worship is also how you live your life. In your everyday life, from Monday to Saturday, the way you live your life, are you showing worth and value to God? It's a, it's a form of worship. It's your true and proper worship. Um, I was... I don't like hypocrisy. And I'm, I'm, I know in my life I've been a hypocrite. There's probably still areas in my life that I'm blind to that I have some hypocrisy. I'm sure that's true. But I don't like hypocrites. But because of that, I got some wrong ideas about worship. I thought if I don't feel like proclaiming God's worth, if I'm just saying the words, then I'm being a hypocrite, so I'm just not going to do it. Well, that, that's not biblical. Here's what the, because there are times you don't feel like making yourself low before God and coming up and kissing his hand. You don't feel like that. But Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Part of being a living sacrifice as a form of worship is bringing a sacrifice of praise. We no longer have to bring a sacrifice of a dead lamb or a pigeon or grain or oil or whatever they did in the old covenant. No, the sacrifice we bring is our own life, including a sacrifice of praise. So when you bring a sacrifice, you don't have to bring it with the idea of like, I totally want to do this. It's like, no, this is right and I'm showing my worship to God. I'm showing his worth by doing it whether I feel like it or not. You think about the greatest sacrifice in history, in the universe, was Christ's sacrifice on the cross, right? Did he feel like doing that? No. He said, God, if there's another way, let's, let's you know, plan B would be good right now didn't feel like, like, he wasn't like, I'm so jacked about dying on the cross, I can't hardly wait for tomorrow, I can't sleep tonight. He couldn't sleep, not because he was so excited, because it's like, I don't want to do this, but I will. I mean, if he can do that for you, can't we, can't we offer him some praise and worship, even if we don't feel like it? Uh, the answer is yes, we should be able to do that. So we need to Bring a sacrifice of praise. Offer, offer God to ourselves before anything else. So, first problem is we neglect God in our worship. Other things have eclipsed his worth and value. We need to get back to the place where he's the, the most valuable thing in our life. And we proclaim that. Number two, we neglect the word of God. So we neglect the worship of God, but we neglect the word of God. <laughs> Really common. This is Jesus speaking in Matthew 7, verse 24 and through 27. He's telling this uh, story to make a point. He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. There are a lot of people, and I'm talking mainly about Christians now, who think God has abandoned them because their life is crashing down around them. Right? Like, God, what is going on? Everywhere I turn, there's destruction. Now, I'm not saying it's always this, but here's what Jesus said. Could it possibly be 
That you're not listening to what I said? I mean, those of us who made it into adulthood alive, you, right? You, like, you're, it's a wonderment that we did because our parents like, don't do that. And we go do it. And like, oh, now I know why they said don't do that. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, it's like, God's word, which we find in, in the Bible, right, is valuable, and it's for our good. Now, a little side note here. The Bible is made up of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And there are a lot of things in the Old Covenant that, that we're no longer under, all right? So uh, there's things in the Old Covenant like a man can't... Uh, trim his sideburns, they need to grow, and, uh, you know, a woman can, a woman can never cut her hair, and uh, you, you shouldn't eat shellfish, uh, so shrimp is off the menu, um, or pork. Those are, those are all under the old covenant for reasons they had back then, right? But we're no longer under the old covenant, we're under the new covenant, and so I'm just telling you, when you read the Bible, you got to read it with the understanding, okay, that's the old covenant, that's no longer applicable to us today. It's important to us, and we need to understand because it all points to Jesus. I'm not saying it doesn't have any value. It has huge value. It's just we're not under some certain sections of the old covenant. We're under the new covenant. All right. But Jesus in the new covenant is loaded with his word, the words of Christ. And he said, the reason you might be struggling is because you're not doing what I say. There's an example, I'm not going to take a lot of time. I talk about this at Freedom Weekend. Um, and I'm not, I'm not going to read the story out of the Bible, but in Matthew 18, Jesus is telling the story of the unmerciful servant, the guy who uh, owed a lot of money to the king and, and he couldn't pay it back, so the king forgave his debt. But then that same guy uh, had somebody that owed him a little bit of money and he went and threw him in debtor's prison because he didn't pay it back. And then the king called him in and said, you wicked servant, Shouldn't you have forgiven your brother like I forgave you? Okay, that story is in the Bible, Matthew 18. That's the Reader's Digest version. Then it says, so the king, who represents God in the story, the king had the servant thrown into, uh, turned over to the jailer to be tortured. And then in, I think it's verse 35 of Matthew 18, Jesus says, and that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you don't forgive your brother from your heart. Okay. Let me explain that a little bit. God is not a torturer. God is not a jailer. But there is one. It's Satan. And what God is saying is, well, let me back up. His word says you need to forgive people. And forgiving doesn't mean you condone what they did. It doesn't mean you're saying it's okay. It doesn't mean that they're off the hook. I mean, they're off your hook. They're just, they're on God's. I've given this sermon before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Go back and look at it uh, on our website. But the Bible tells us we need to forgive people. And if you are unwilling to forgive someone, you're disagreeing with God. Right? Right? God says, forgive them, everyone. And you're like, I'll, I'll forgive that person, that person, that person. But you don't understand what that person did to me. I, I will not forgive them. Well, when you do that, you're disagreeing with God. You're not agreeing with his word. And when you do that, you've, you've, you've kind of moved yourself out from his protection. And you've, you've given access to the enemy to attack you. You've given what we call it, you've given what we call legal authority to the enemy. The enemy can't do whatever he wants to you. I just realized I'm getting a whole nother sermon, but I'll, I'll come around and we'll get back on it. The devil just can't do whatever he wants to you because he was defeated on the cross of Christ. He just, he can't do whatever he wants. He can only do what you agreed to let him do. I didn't say that right. He only has an opening in your life 
when you agree with him. And when you will not forgive someone, this is right from Jesus' mouth, you have opened yourself to the attack of the enemy, called legal consent, open doors. It's not God trying to teach you a lesson. It's not him torturing you, jailing you. It's you saying, hey, I got my own plan. Thank you. Thanks for creation. Thanks for the Rocky Mountain front. Thank you for blueberry pie. I'm going to go do my own thing now. That's really what we're saying. And God's like, all right, let's see how that works for you. <laughs> you're getting you're just hammered by the enemy. And then, but then people get hammered by the enemy when they do that. I'm like, God, where are you? <laughs> I'm where I always was. Where are you? I mean, that's a, just one example that Jesus used of when we s- disagree with him, and with his word, and step out and do our own thing, you've opened yourself up to a lot of stuff. And, and there, <laughs> there are people suffering the consequences, not of God trying to teach them a lesson or God ignoring them. It's like, no, you've opened yourself up to the enemy because you are not, you're willingly not doing, willingly and knowingly not doing God's word. You're doing what the heck you want to do. So I'm some, I sound like a grumpy old man today. I don't mean to, <laughs> but this is, sometimes you got to hear the hard truth, right? Because if we don't, we just kind of keep doing what we're doing and like, God, where are you? So what's the solution? Do what God's word says. I don't know how else to say it. Do what it says. Again, understanding there's a difference between the old covenant and new covenant, right? And you got to interpret it correctly. Because sometimes people get like, well, it says it in... It says it in the Bible, yeah, one sentence taken out of context and you're doing weird and wacky stuff. Just, right. That's why you need to be here and be discipled. James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. If you want to live a blessed life, do what God says. That's pretty simple. It's like, yeah, but I kind of want to do this. Well, you certainly have the choice to do that. It's a bad choice. I mean, <laughs> oh man, so much I want to say and so much trouble would get me into, but it just, oh, especially in the area of relationships, okay? Younger people, it's like somebody the opposite sex they're interested in if they're unmarried. <laughs> Hopefully they're unmarried. If they're married, they're already out of God's word, right? But if they're not married to that person. And they're like, oh man, that person is really good looking or they're really funny or they're really this or man, I I like to be around them or I want to be their boyfriend, girlfriend or whatever it is. Or maybe it's like, I just want to hook up with them. That's the new thing, right? Um, And it's like, are you giving any thought of where they're at with God? And is this a healthy thing, or is this just a sort of a sensual desire that you have, and you're trying to fill up this hole in your life through this certain unhealthy relationship? (laughs) That happens a lot, a lot. And then people, all of a sudden, then they find themselves in love or not in love, but in a relationship they can't get out of, and their whole world's crashing in around them like, God, where are you? I've been here the whole time. You're the one that wandered off. You're the one that crowded me out because you just had to have that person in your life. The wrong person that I, that's not the person I had for you, but you needed to have that person so bad that you walked off and, and you put more worth on that than my word God doesn't get as mad as I get. Okay. (laughs) 
I'm just going to quit. But do you understand what I'm saying? I hope. So we need to do what God's word says. Okay, I'll just say this. This was really good. I was listening to a podcast. I'm trying to see what time it is. We're going to get out in plenty of time. I was listening to a podcast uh, this week by a, a pastor that I really, really uh, appreciate, uh, Dr. Timothy Keller. Some of you may have heard of him. He's a, a Presbyterian pastor, uh, just retired from his, the church that he founded in New York, Redeemer Presbyterian, and uh, just a really godly man and is so deep. Uh, and I just, I've learned so much from him. I just, I really like him. And uh, he was, so I was listening on a podcast and he said, in, in our church, the Christian churches in America, you've kind of got your, what we call the, the mainline liberal churches. And then you got you know, the more evangelical, fundamental, like Bible believing churches, right? And it's like in the, the more evangelical, fundamental churches, it's all about the, the two big things are, as it relates to our society today, is abortion and gay marriage, or just homosexuality. It's like, the, it's, it's against God's word, and if you engage in that, you're going against God, God's word, which is true, right? That is true. But then you got some of the mainline denominations, many people call the liberal denominations, that are like, Jesus' heart is for the marginalized people. It's social justice. That's their key word, social justice. That's not God's heart that people languish in poverty and, and, and uh, their thing, the other thing is racial uh, equality. That's not God's heart. Totally true. 100% true. If you look at Jesus dealing with people in the Gospels, he, he was drawn to the marginalized. He was drawn to the people who, who were the down and outers. And maybe it was their own fault. See, we, we're like, well, if they just get a job and get off their butt and get to work. They're... Sometimes that's true. But, but we make all these judgment calls and we get like, well, they just blah, 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 blah. Plus the people who are helping them are for gay marriage and abortion. So we're not... So like, but it's totally, totally biblical, this idea of social justice and racial equality, but there's a lot of the more conservative churches hardly ever talk about it. It's not even on their radar usually. And yet, the, but those same churches that talk about it a lot never talk about the, the sin of homosexuality or abortion. They almost never talk. In fact, they say it's not a sin, right? So <laughs> there are churches who ignore large parts of God's word. And we as more conservative evangelical type churches, Bible-believing churches, we think, oh, we got the drop on God's word. We're totally doing it because we're not for gay marriage and we're not for abortion. Yeah, but what are you doing for racial equality, which is God's heart? No Jew, no slave, no Greek, no whatever, you know? There's, or what are you doing for the marginalized? Would Jesus totally work for? What are you doing for them? How are you working for social justice? Well, we'd, okay, off my rant. I guess what I'm trying to say is that challenged me, listen to that podcast this week. Like we all get all, we, we're, we're the ones that follow God's word. Oh, do we really? Because sometimes we don't because we have our little pet God's words truths, right? And sometimes we ignore other truths. All right. I kind of got off track there, but I think somebody needed to hear that. Maybe it was just me. Number three, we know it, we neglect the will of God. So we neglect the worship of God. We neglect the word of God, but then we neglect the will of God. This is probably really illustrated in the life of the disciples, right after Jesus' death and resurrection, and even after his resurrection. If you remember leading up to Jesus' death, the disciples were arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Like, hey, when Jesus takes over as king, 
And he's in Jerusalem like next month and he's kicking the Romans in the butt and, and I'm going to be the one sitting next to him. No, I am. No, you're not. I am. Their will was like the will of a lot of people of Israel that time. Their will was Jesus comes in, chases out the Romans, sets himself up as king, and finally we take our rightful place. That's so going to happen. It's going to be so awesome. I can't wait. Except that wasn't what Jesus came to do at that time. Jesus came to die for sins, for people. And even when he, and he tried to explain it to him, and so after his death, and when Jesus appeared to him on the night of his resurrection, on Resurrection Sunday, they were all sitting around, griping, grousing, melancholy, like, we thought, we thought this was going to be a big deal. We thought Jesus was the guy. We thought he was going to do this and do that. They just totally missed his will. They totally missed it. Because they were so intent on their will. And even, even after Jesus appeared to them and scared the you-know-what out of them on resurrection night, proved that he was alive. Like, do you remember what I said? That I was going to die and rise again? Oh, yeah. So he says, go meet me in Galilee, right? Go, go meet me up there where we used to run around. And so after the, even after they see the risen Jesus, they're back in Galilee like, oh, same spot. <sighs> Might as well go fishing. Anybody want to go fishing? Let's go fishing. So there they are, back to their old life, fishing. Not for men. Jesus said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. That was his will. But now they're not fishing for men. Now they're fishing for fish like they used to. They were back kind of down in the dumps because their will wasn't being realized like they thought it would be in the life of Christ. So Jesus had the, the will he came for, right? Which didn't line up with their will. So it's easy to neglect the will of God when it doesn't line up with our will. It's like, I want this so bad. So badly, I think is what the correct grammar is. I want this so badly that we, we can just forget what God wants and we get so focused on what we want. So what's the solution? Let God's plan, or let, God, let God's will take precedence over your own will. You need to like God, you need to be like Jesus on the night before he was crucified. Lord, if, if there's another way, let's do it. But nevertheless, your will, not mine. And that's what, that needs to be our prayer. Lord, whatever your will is, not my will, but whatever yours is. So you might be saying, well, how, how do I know God's will? How would I even know that? Let's go back to Romans 12, 1 and 2. I already read one. I'm going to read it again so you see it in context. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Except how do you test God's will? How do you approve God's will? Who are you to approve God's will? But isn't that what it says? That if you renew your mind, think like God thinks, then you can approve his will? What's that all about? Here's what it's about. Illustration. If you found a painting in your attic that looked like it was from somebody famous, you, would, you wouldn't just say, hey, this is from somebody famous, or you wouldn't just throw it away because it's not somebody famous. You would take it to an art expert, right? Somebody who has experience. Like, I think this is from Van Gogh. And you would take it to a Van Gogh expert, and that expert would say, well, he'd look at the brush strokes, he'd look at the, the type of media you use, the canvas, 
um, the, type of, the type of paint. He would look at all that and make a determination whether or not that's a Van Gogh, okay? That's, so he would approve whether that's real or not. It's similar with us. We're to be in God's word, in, in his presence through worship. We're to be so connected with God that we know him. We know how he acts. We know his character and nature. So when something comes up, it's like, that's not the will of God. I know God, and that's not his will. See, we, that's how we approve his will. We don't like, I don't like it, so I'm not approving it. No. It's like what we're doing is like seeing, because we know God, whether that's his will or not. You can know God's will. You should know God's will. But you have to know God to know his will. Thanks for hearing my grumpy old man sermon. But I think this is important because through the years I've just seen, like I said, I've seen people crowd God out of their life little by little. It's nothing they really wanted to do, nothing they were knowingly doing. And then all of a sudden, someday they wake up like, I think God has abandoned me. Where's God? Or what is God doing to me? Why is he doing this to me? Like, he's not doing it to you. You're doing it to yourself. So, how do, how do we come back to God after neglecting him? We need to engage in passionate worship. Live a life of worship. Be a doer of the word and not just a hearer of the word. And then trust the will of God and follow it. we dismiss this morning I just want to pray that for you why don't you just stand if you're physically able God wants you to flourish I want that to be really clear again doesn't mean every day is going to be easy but he does want you to flourish he doesn't want you to live a dispirited life and he wants you to live a life that, he, that you know that he has not abandoned you. But as we all know, there are times in our lives, or at least at times and maybe people we know that we do feel abandoned. And it's because we've not kicked God out of our life, we've crowded him out. We've neglected him. We've neglected him in worship. We've neglected him in his word. We've neglected his will. If we'll, if we'll come back to that, come back to a place of heartfelt worship, not only just here on Sunday morning, although that's really important, but how we live our life of attributing worth and value to him. And, and to get into his word, to actually do what he says and not just pick and choose what we like to do and, and not do the, the rest of it. And then we need to get to know him. We need to be in a place of that worship in the word so that we know his will. So we just aren't going against it. I want to pray that for you now. Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, show us any areas in our life, Lord, where we're, we're putting more worth and value on it rather than you. If there's anything in us where that's happening, Lord, I, I ask you just show that to us now in Jesus' name. Not in, a, not in a guilting and shaming way, but in a way like we can, we can get back on track. Lord, we do not want to neglect you in worship. We want you to be the most worthy, the most valuable in our life. Lord, show us, Holy Spirit, how we might be not paying attention to certain parts of your word. There's some areas of your word we really glom onto, but then there's some areas that we maybe we're ignoring. If there are any, Holy Spirit, reveal those to us. And then, Lord, we want to know your will. And you say we can know your will, but we need to know you. So, Lord, draw us close to you so that we can know your will, so that we can let that take precedence in our life rather than our own will. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your great love for us. 
and we want to come back to you fully. We don't want to neglect you in any way. Help us to do that, Holy Spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, have a great Memorial weekend. Enjoy the weather. Uh, Enjoy the great week, and we'll see you back here next Sunday. You're dismissed. Have a great week.